right, Mark, it's super nice to have you uh, for a small chat. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, everything is prepared for the DuckCon, right? Yeah. How are you feeling? Uh, amazing. What can I say? We're here in San Francisco. We're here. Uh, we just had a fantastic keynote by Hannes. Yeah. At the Data and AI Summit, and now we're doing DuckCon in front of a, a whole new crowd, like halfway. That's true. The, the world. It's, uh, right. yeah, it's not the same audience that you used to. It's the first time in the U.S., right? Uh, the first time we're doing DuckCon in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. First time. I mean, we have done two DuckCons, yeah. uh, three DuckCons actually, one online, one in Brussels, and now one in San Francisco. Yeah. Or, originally, our plan was to do one per year. Yeah. But somehow, we have already, this is like our second thing. <laughs> yeah. So, we, uh, what can I say? It's just a lot of fun. So you're CTO at DuckDB Lab. Yeah. You're a co-creator of so, uh, mm -hmm. uh, DuckDB. Mm -hmm. What's your relationship to the products today uh, compared to Hannes? Yeah, I think it's, um, I still do a lot of technical work. Like I myself still kind of push a lot of like programming stuff out there. Hannes does as well, but less so. Like um, in the end, I, as CTO, I do a lot of the technical management of people. Like I guide them on uh, uh, with the problems that they encounter yeah. in the code base. I review their pull requests. I look at what they're working on um, and guide them some, uh, guide them in what they should be working on as well. And that does kind of require me to have quite in-depth knowledge of essentially the whole code base, right? Yeah. So, and in order to maintain that, I also have to keep programming. It's kind of the way I feel as well. And it's also just what I enjoy, right? Like yeah. we started this because we enjoyed it. So I still do a lot of programming. Hannes still does programming as well, but I would say like in terms of sheer numbers, let's say I do like three days a week and Hannes does like one day a week. Yeah. It's like um, yeah. the division is a little bit... Um, and there is more people, right? There's many more people. How many? Uh, so we're now around 15 people. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's definitely also has changed my role significantly. Like I used to just be five days a week programming. Stuff, or six days, depending on how I felt. I have meetings. <laughs> <laughs> so the meetings, we, we don't really have many scheduled meetings, but we have like people come and ask me questions, right? And of course, um, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. Like uh, often I'm the only one that's able to answer them. And it's in a sense, very nice because it actually means we get a lot more done, right? Like yeah. as a team, we can focus on different things. Different people can do different things. Um, and as a team, we accomplish much more than what m just me and Hannes could accomplish, right? So it is a big productivity booster to have all these people. But for me personally, of course, it takes time away from programming. Yes. It's actually fine. Like I do enjoy guiding and mentoring people as well. Um, but it's definitely a, a change of scenery from where we were when we started DuckTube. Nice. Uh, what's your biggest challenge at the moment regarding the open source <laughs> management? Um, I think at the moment, everything is going quite smooth um we have had different challenges with uh outside contributors of course um where mostly the the, the thing is like we allow outside contributions and i think that's important because yeah. i want people from the community to feel like they can contribute and um, leave their impression on the product as well but of course there is a time investment from us from our side that comes to vetting the code making sure it all works and making sure it all uh, well, essentially, we have to gatekeep the code so that the other users don't run into issues by like mm -hmm. a few people that do contribute and submit pull requests. So we have had some uh, some issues where we had for where we had, for example, refuse certain changes because they were just too large for an outside contributor, and we didn't have the time to uh, to like look yeah. at a two hundred file changed PR, for example. Yeah. Like it would take us longer to look at the PR and vet it and make sure everything works than it would if um, if we just made it ourselves. And also with outside contributors, they can kind of just throw this over the fence and it becomes our problem. Right? Yeah. So uh, we have to make sure the code base is like in a good state always. Uh, the outside contributors, they don't have any of this obligation. So there's like some inherent um, responsibilities that get shifted when someone mm -hmm. opens a pull request. And I, I wouldn't say it's... Uh, Terrible. But they have the credibility. I, you know, they have, I contributed, I yeah, contributed yeah, exactly. to the project. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're maintaining it. They're, 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 there's some people that have done some contributions that um, were definitely quite valuable, but in yeah. the end, we had to either rewrite or rework them mm -hmm. in quite significant ways uh, to the point where probably it cost us more time than if we had just done it ourselves. Um, it, it's always something to balance with outside contributors. Like it is 
uh, it's nice, but it's also a risk, let's say. Yeah, and um, what what would be the be best advice you give an outside contributor to maximize his success to have his PR or speaker ID merge? Yeah, so I think the first thing that we advise people to do is to talk to us. Yeah. Like to actually uh, ask. So hey, Discord? Yeah, Discord, uh, uh, open an, a, f a discussion on GitHub mm -hmm. and have a chat. Because we have seen, I think the your PR is most likely to get rejected if you just open a big PR yeah. without discussing with us first. Like if you t if you come to us and you say, hey, I want to implement this feature or I want to have this in the project, can I work on it? And we say yes, then we're of course much less likely to say later, okay, uh, we don't want this. We may still say that it's not a sufficient quality or we may give like pointers as in uh, you should uh, improve the test coverage, should add more tests, you should uh, rewrite this piece of code. But in principle, if we say you're allowed or like we would like to see you work on this, yeah. then that's all right. I th we have had some people that unfortunately have submitted, have done like a lot of work on something that they thought was important, but that in the end we could not merge because it was just a giant pull request for a feature that we didn't really want. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. so discussing before, it's it's yeah. it's actually kind of the same mindset for any software engineering team, right? Definitely. You instead of diving straight to, or if you're not sure, even if you have requirement and you have a ticket, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not sure about about it, you can always double check. Exactly. To avoid to have a long and painful discussion in the PR. <laughs> no, for sure. And I think one thing that's quite nice about what, where we're going right now is that we have this extension system now. Yeah. And that I think takes away a lot of these things because people can write their own extension or they can mm -hmm. uh, contribute to an external extension and that we don't even have to interface with that, yeah. right? Like they can make their own extension that can do the feature that they desire and they can work on it completely separate from us. We don't need to see the code. We don't need to interact with the code. And then they can have the joy of like doing whatever they want. And, but we won't be stuck like holding the, 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 the bag, so to speak. Yeah. Right? Like having mm -hmm. to maintain that piece of software. It is then also fully their responsibility. Yeah. No, no that's great. Um, cool. What's the biggest feature you're most bullish on DuckDB that's been already it's or already been developed. I think, uh, I mean, there, there has been very many. I think the, the feature that um, has been the most, that I have personally developed in the last few months mm -hmm. that has seen the most praise has to be the pivot and unpivot, I think. Okay. That was something that actually I decided to work on because I was looking at the GitHub issues and I saw that that issue had like the most uh, upvotes from people. So I figured, well, people must like this. And then I started working on it and immediately tons of people were very happy. They all responded, people were testing it. It was something that immediately saw a lot of success. Yeah. And it was, uh, yeah, I was very happy with that, of course, like to make something that's truly useful to a lot of people. Cool, can, can you give us like just a short explanation of the feature for people who are- Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, pivoting and unpivoting, um, it's, it's like if you know pivot uh, tables in Excel, it's based on that. Essentially, it means turning columns into rows or rows into columns. And that's kind of an, a cool feature because in SQL, you can normally not query columns in the same way that you can query rows, right? Like if you have rows, you can filter on them, you can group on them, you can yeah. do all these operations because that's the, the way the language is designed. By being able to turn columns into rows, you can then solve either these operations on columns. And that's yeah. super helpful because a lot of data sets actually encodes data points as columns, right? Like you can imagine you have a data set that's like, oh, you have the population per year. Hmm. And then you have the columns are like population in like 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. And that is actually a data point, right? And then if you want to do a, um, a, a reshaping of that data to uh, do like a grouping over like uh, uh, essentially like pivoting, that's yeah. what it's called, to do a grouping over the columns instead, then you need this pivot and unpivot. Yeah, yeah. so and it's then, it less, less good for... <laughs> For yeah. The same yeah. yeah, like doing this stuff, you can do it yourself in SQL as well, but yeah. it's just way more work. And especially it's work that scales linearly with the amount mm. of columns. Like every single yeah. column you'd have, you need to add something. So being able to do this like yeah. in, in an easier way is very valuable. Cool. Last question. If you had 100 developers for a month that can do anything for you on the DuckDB project, what would you do? That's a very, very nice question. So 100 developers, I think you always have this issue when you have a lot of developers that they kind of 
butt heads and like a conflict. So if yeah. I had a hundred developers, I'd put them on probably a hundred different things. Um, <laughs> that's a lot of things to name right now, but I think something that I have personally wanted to do, but haven't really had time for is more things like tooling around DuckDB. Like for example, having a SQL formatter based on DuckDB or like a better uh, syntax highlighter or like a better autocomplete, stuff like that, which I think is something that's, it's a lot of independent parts that each of these extensions. developers can work on. <laughs> they could all be extensions, exactly. They don't need to communicate for that. And it's something that's, yeah, definitely, I think that's something that is could be super useful to people. Yeah. And also, like, I would I, I would like to use myself in a lot of situations. So that's also, uh, yeah, often what inspires me to do things is, like, what would be useful to me. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much for your time, Mark. Oh, thanks. Uh, I'll let you, you know, relax a bit before mm -hmm. the tech con and everybody showing up. Uh, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>